Bucket of Blood and Little Shop of Horrors are inextricably linked because they tell the exact same story using the same stock characters, but with two different types of filmmaking and two different kinds of comedy. Yeah, I know that's basically what the last two episodes were about, and I swear I didn't do that on purpose, but this isn't quite the same situation as with Not of This Earth. To show you what I mean, though, here's a quick plot summary for both movies at the same time. Walter slash Seymour is a hopeless nerd who is desperate to impress his peers, and is very passionate about sculpting slash botany, but isn't actually any good at it. Through a random accident, he hides the body of a dead cat slash feeds blood to a plant, and the result is so impressive that everybody treats him like a genius. Later, he unintentionally kills a human and incorporates that body into his project, which is even more popular, resulting in a series of murders to fuel the creative process. He has a pretty female co-worker who's taller than he is, whom he barely knows and wants to marry anyway, and he gains her affection through his success. His boss finds out the secret to his success and decides not to alert the authorities because he's making too much money. Finally, during a a big party where Walter slash Seymour is toast of the town, his secret is revealed and the cops chase him through a bunch of dark alleys. He escapes them, but later commits suicide out of shame, and the movie concludes with a shot of the protagonist having literally become, in death, a permanent part of his own artwork. The end. Obviously, this is a dark, tragic story, and yet both films were created and marketed as comedies. Bucket of Blood suggested that the audience would be sick, sick, sick from laughing, and Little Shop billed itself as the funniest picture this year. And considering its main competition in 1960 was Cinderfella with Jerry Lewis, they might have been right. They are full of murder and pathos, though, so here's where the whole concept of black comedy comes in. Comedy that revolves around cynicism and making light of serious topics. Corman had the following to say about the genre. I don't know who came up with the idea for black comedy. I might have. It might be an original idea of mine, but I'm sure somebody had done it before. Although it's certainly not true that he was the first person to ever utilize Gallo's humor, this was somewhat new ground in terms of film. Bucket of Blood in particular was actually somewhat edgy for the time, with its completely honest depiction of the beatnik culture it satirized. Although the comedy and horror elements of both films seem incredibly watered down and subtle to people today, critics and audiences loved both movies when they were released, possibly because they trod new territory in somehow making gory murders and creepy obsessions funny. I then kind of worked out some vague psychological theory, which I still believe in to a certain extent, that horror and humor and sex to a certain extent are very similar. In each case, you build up the tension, you build it up and up and up, and then you break it. Boy, what I did. And if you break, build it the right way and break it the right way, you get a scream from horror, you get a laugh from humor, and you get a lot of fun from sex. You kind of have to wonder if Roger Corman was sort of the Louis C.K. of the 50s in terms of how he popularized darker humor with a wider audience, marrying the sensations of laughter and discomfort together like nobody else had before. Though they both contain dark subject matter, the actual jokes themselves differ widely between the two movies, which represent two different styles of comedy. Bucket of Blood, which was made first, is more of a standard satire, which pokes fun at the art world and the beat generation by taking real life and amping it up just enough to be ridiculous. The hippies that Walter spends time with at the coffee shop seem to speak solely in poems, slang, and vague allusions to being properly with it. One of the greatest advances in modern poetry is the elimination of clarity. I am proud to say my poetry is only understood by that minority which is aware. Aware of what? Why not of anything stupid, just aware. Another source of humor is how intensely they all react to Walter's sculptures, even though they obviously don't look that amazing to the audience. Walter, I can't believe it. I'm honored to know this man. Do you think it's nice? Hey, she's beautiful. Do you think it's nice in a murdered man? Oh, I don't know, Walter. It's impossible to choose. They're both great. It's not clear whether this was intentionally done for humor's sake, or if it's just a side effect of the low budget, which required them to use department store mannequins instead of real statues. Aside from that, though, Bucket of Blood is very well composed as a film, with a cool noir look to many of the shots that helps build tension, and lots of stark lighting techniques during the most dramatic scenes. Really, the only thing I don't like about this movie is the title. It just has nothing to do with the plot, and it only served as a sensational piece of marketing. The posters for the movie didn't even mention the plot. They just had a bunch of cartoons with gags about the title. Weird. Little Shop is usually described as a farce, and the humor is much more broad, with a continual procession of stereotypical gag characters that go in and out of the titular shop. 
We've got the old Jewish lady whose relatives are always dying. Ah, good morning, Mrs. Shiva. How's things today? Oh, the same as usual, Mr. Mushnick. My sister's nephew, Stanley, died in Little Rock, Arkansas. Oh, what that is? He got blown up. Who knows how? That's nice. We've got Seymour's hypochondriac mother. Did you stop at Dr. Mallard's and get the results of my test? Yeah, he said there's nothing wrong with you. Oh, now, Dr. Mallard, he, he's one doctor I thought would tell the truth. He said you should be playing fullback for the Rams. He wants me dead. Nobody wants to help me, and I'm dying. You're not dying, Mom. I got the results of the test back. I definitely have breast cancer. And we've got the weird guy from the neighborhood who eats flowers, played here by Dick Miller, who was the star of Bucket of Blood and also played Vacuum Cleaner Guy from Not of This Earth. Crazy. One highlight is the pair of police characters, who are an obvious parody of the guys from Dragnet. They provide narration, which isn't really necessary, but also have several great scenes during their investigation of all the disappearances. How's the wife, Frank? Not bad, Joe. Glad to hear it. The kids? Lost one yesterday. Lost one, eh? How'd that happen? Playing with matches. Well, those are bricks. Yeah, I guess so. The dialogue is full of rapid-fire puns and malapropisms, which go by so fast that you can actually miss a lot of it the first time you watch it. It reminds me of an old Marx Brothers movie more than anything else, though without all the harp solos. It's like watching a vaudeville show, though, especially since all the sets have clear fourth walls to them, so most of the movie is blocked like a stage play. Since the production was very rushed, they shot the film with a simple two-camera setup and flat, static lighting, resulting in a movie that looks like a sitcom. It's a shame they didn't have more time, since the cinematography makes the movie look much cheaper, especially compared to the dramatic shooting style of Bucket of Blood. Aside from inspiring the musical with Rick Moranis, Little Shop is probably best known for being the first movie to feature Jack Nicholson, one of many famous actors who got his start in Hollywood through Roger Corman. His character only shows up in one scene to provide some comic relief, which is both completely unnecessary to the plot and just really weird. Now, no Novocaine. It dulls the senses. <laughs> this is gonna hurt you more than it is me. Oh, goody, goody, here it comes. <laughs> oh, my God, don't stop now! Well, I made a lot of holes, and now I gotta fill it up with this here silver stuff. Well, aren't you gonna pull any? Well, uh... Oh, go on. Even though his role is little more than an extended, one-joke cameo, most home video releases of this movie put Jack's face squarely on the cover, as if he's the star. The worst offender is probably this one, where somebody actually went to the trouble of painting Jack Nicholson holding what's supposed to be the evil plant. You know why they had to paint it? Because Nicholson never appears on screen with the plant, and has literally nothing to do with that storyline. Still, it's neat to see him super young and still playing kooky off-the-wall characters, rather than just playing himself like in more recent movies. The production of these two films were done very close to each other, and there are a lot of stories floating around about exactly how they're connected. The most commonly known legend is that when shooting for Bucket of Blood wrapped, they were ahead of schedule and had a few days of rentals left on the locations and sets. Corman didn't want the extra to go to waste, so he just decided to shoot a whole second movie in two days, using a script they happened to have lying around. While I definitely wouldn't put that past him, the truth is a little less fantastic. Little Shop actually was shot in only two days, and it did use borrowed sets that were about to be torn down, but the reason for the quick schedule was a bit more subtle. The film was shot at the end of December 1959, because at the start of 1960, film industry rules were going to change, requiring the producer to pay residuals to the actors for any re-releases of the movie they starred in, rather than just buying out their entire stake at once, like they'd been doing. So, yeah, it was made fast, but only so Corman could sneak in one more movie production before the laws made him change his business model. You know, there's Frugal, there's Thrifty, and then there's being Roger Goddamn Corman. Making lots of money. Aside from penny pinching, though, these films were special to Corman for a few other reasons. They were his first attempts at making comedies, and were meant as slight parodies of the kinds of exploitation movies he'd been doing so far. In his autobiography, Corman points to these two films as especially personal for him. In some of my films, there's a theme of an artist who must destroy or be destroyed in order to create. Bucket and Little Shop come to mind. Clearly, there's something of me in those films. The creative process is very difficult for me. 
But even as I felt that I might have overdone it, made too many films in too short a time, I found myself getting increasing recognition from the critics. To what extent did I put myself on screen through my own characters? There are parts of me in all my films, but which parts? Corman goes on to mention the Walter and Seymour characters specifically, both of them being artists who have to destroy in order to create and entertain. Do breakneck shooting schedules and low budgets really do violence to anything? Do Corman-style B-movies really hurt the medium of cinema as a whole? Dick Miller said afterward that he was disappointed by the restrictions of a small budget, suggesting that if a few technical elements like the statues had been improved, Bucket of Blood would have become a true classic. Maybe, but if the results are beloved by audiences and well-liked to this day, does it really matter how they got made or why? Perhaps the beatnik poet at the beginning of Bucket sums it up best. Creation is. All else is not. What is not creation is Graham Cracker. Let it all crumble to feed the creator. Sometimes, to break new ground, you have to break a lot of other things in the process, and... Hey, it, there's the bucket of blood. There actually is one. He, he's literally catching the blood in a... Well, it's really more of a pan than a bucket, but... Yeah, well, who cares? The fact is, these movies are both well-directed, well-acted, and really charming snapshots of the late 50s. They're both in the public domain and both very short, so why not check them out? There's also the musical version of Little Shop, of course, but Corman wasn't involved with that movie. He did executive produce the 1995 remake of Bucket of Blood for the Showtime channel, but we're not going through that whole business again. Maybe some other time. Tune in next week for the Roger Cormania Halloween special, a quadruple feature of aliens, vampires, Frankenstein monsters, and Linda Blair's horrifying 80s shoulder pads. Be seeing you. Now when you come to the shop, what you're getting, what you see, so just be careful. Getting close to me. Little shop, little shop. Take me to the little shop, little shop. I want to go to the little shop. Word, little shop. And I'm all booked up for the rest of the day, so you'll have to come back tomorrow. Oh, I couldn't do that. I have three or four abscesses, a touch of pyorrhea, nine or ten cavities, I lost my pivot tooth, and I'm in terrible pain. <laughs> well, I, I can't help you today. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> I'll, I'll just wait outside. <laughs>